Well, we're the second half of day three and people are still sitting and standing. So I first want to thank you all for your great patience and your interest in the issues that are being discussed at this Penwar Conference and the Oregon Coast Economic Summit. I'm Caddy McEwen. I represent House District 9, which is down on the south coast. I have about 120 miles of coastline from Coos Bay to Yahats and in almost to the Eugene area. Um, I'm delighted to facilitate this, this esteemed group of legislators and community leaders this afternoon in a conversation about um, economic development, how we manage natural resources, and particularly about how we overcome urban and rural issues. Engaging with partners across urban and rural divides is very complex in our state, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to host this conversation about it today. Um, what I'd like to do is, is invite my colleagues uh, to give you some introductory remarks. We'll start with our three legislators and then we'll move on to our community leaders. We'll have, uh, I'm sure some issues will come up during these introductory remarks that will generate some questions from you all. We'd like this to be a very interactive session this afternoon. We have about 90 minutes so we have plenty of time hopefully to delve deeply into the issues of how we um, on the coattails of what's happening in our urban centers uh, with recovery from the recession, how do we bring our rural communities along? It's something we struggle with every single day and very much looking forward to this conversation. I'd like to first introduce uh, Senator Betsy Johnson. Sen the senator represents uh, the Senate District Number 16. Uh, the senator has a long history of public service and most of you are probably very well aware of the, the wonderful work that she's been doing in our state and for her district for a very, very long time. Um, the senator's been involved with the Oregon Health Science University Foundation, the Dornbecker Children's Hospital, the Oregon Public Broadcasting Foundation, the High Desert Museum. Those are just a very small list of the things that she's been involved in her, in her very esteemed career, serving on numerous local, regional, and national boards and commissions. We are very, very grateful for her leadership in our state. Um, and Senator Johnson is a member of the Coastal Caucus. This economic summit is being, being hosted by the Oregon Coastal Caucus. So she's been a part of um, everything that we've been doing here as, a, as an economic Coastal Caucus for the last six years. So welcome, Senator Johnson. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was asked yesterday when we, a number of us were interviewed. Mike. Mike, uh, help. There, I got it. All right. Uh, switch. Uh, several of us had the opportunity yesterday to be interviewed by Charter Communication for their local newsmakers program. And the first question that they asked was uh, of me, what was the value of having the Coastal Economic Summit in Portland? And it was a very easy question to answer. I think for some of us that represent more rural, places that are dependent on natural resource economies and tend sometimes to be a little bit more conservative than some of our progressive brothers and sisters in the metropolitan core. It is an opportunity to bring our values, our issues, and our voice into downtown Portland to talk about some of the things that are of paramount importance to our constituents and to our communities. And I look out across this room and I see county commissioners from many of the counties that I'm privileged to represent, and I know the sorts of things that we work on on a daily basis. So even though this is a pretty familiar hometown crowd, I think that there are still some bleed overs from the Penoir Conference and certainly some people that represent downtown Portland because this is an easier venue to get to than some of our formal, uh, former coastal sites. And it is a chance for us to give a very authentic articulation to what are the issues that we worry about on a daily basis when our constituents get up and go to work to try to find housing, to try to find jobs, and to try to maintain a character of communities that is embedded in who they are. I think of Astoria, for example, and it may be somewhat anomalous in my district in that this was a pretty gritty little industrial town. It relied very heavily on cutting down trees and putting fish in cans and um, was one time one of the wealthiest towns in the western part of the United States. When the timber went away and when the canneries were shut down, Astoria was faced with the very real problem of how does it reinvent itself. And I would submit to you it has done an extraordinary 
extraordinary job of just that kind of metamorphosis. One can go to Astoria now and find hotels that rival any of the Portland hotels. You can go to any restaurant and find culinary delights uh, and, and that particular setting. You know the family that caught the fish. You know the family that served the fish, cooked the fish, served the fish. So it is food with a story that has led to a revolution in how the North Coast, uh, especially Astoria, thinks of itself as a place of character and draws very heavily on its old traditions to reinvent a new economy. That will work in some places, not so much in other places. And as you will hear from my colleagues, as we look up and down the coast, there are still places that are trying to find their spot in, uh, in coastal commerce. Newport is developing itself into, many of us believe, the woods hole of the west. We still have got to figure out how to have multiple uses at docks carrying multiple commodities. We have burgeoning seafood processors up and down the coast. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that a place like Astoria has taken on building on its past this new character of a welcoming uh, tourist spot and mecca for hospitality, many of our districts still are looking to find regular jobs that rely, again, very heavily on natural resources. So for my district, and I see Representative Boone, my colleague who shares uh, our coastal uh, uh, locations, whether it's people making cheese in Tillamook, whether it's processors, oyster, all manner of seafood, whether it is craft brewers, the coast is a vibrant and interesting place. And today's panel and the fact that this, uh, this seminar, this gathering of folks is held in Portland allows us to tell to the Portland media, Portland folks that are here, the coast is alive and well. We welcome you. Uh, we are a place of opportunity, but sometimes some of the policies and processes that you all have put in place simply don't fit in our locations. Cut us a little slack as we try to keep the coast economically viable, and we'll be happy to answer any questions as we move through the rest of the panel. But in the meantime, know you're all invited down to Oregon's glorious coast to have one of the best times of your life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Johnson. As you can tell, the Senator's experience um, working with the Department of Transportation, she's founder of Transwestern Aviation. She has a very storied history in this state, and I am very grateful to her for the work that she did um, assisting us bring a transportation package to fruition this session. She sat on the 14-member committee, spent hours and hours and hours and hours doing wonderful work. Her background is, is, is remarkable, and we're very fortunate to have her serving the Oregon Legislature. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Senator Jeff Cruz. Uh, Senator Cruz and I have been um, fortunate enough to share the chairmanship and vice chairmanship of the Coastal Caucus now for five or six years. Um, we just swapped. He is now the chair of the Coastal Caucus, and he's a, a d delight to work with. Jeff and I come from very different places, very different philosophical backgrounds, but in the Coastal Caucus, the one thing we do is we check politics at the door, and when the seven of us sit in a room, we're talking about things that impact the coast, uh, and it's been a, a pleasure to get to know Senator Cruz. Um, Senator Cruz is a lifelong resident of Douglas County, has an extensive background in government, including uh, the Douglas Soil and Water Conservation District, very important in rural communities, Oregon Association of Conservation Districts, Farm Home Administration County Committee, and the Douglas County Planning Advisory Committee. He is also the one member, I believe, of our panel, uh, except well, I think Representative of Huffman, too, has an agricultural background. But uh, Cruz Farms is a very important part of Douglas County, particularly this time of year. And we're fortunate that we were able to wrench him away from his tractor for a couple of days to come up and join us. So, Senator Jeff Cruz. Thank you. Actually, we're, we're kind of transitioning. We just finished blueberry harvest and strawberries are done, cherries are about done, raspberries are about done, so, but melons are coming on and we have corn and, uh, oh, I Can't should be wait. talking about something else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's my pleasure to be here. It, it's, it's always fun to follow Senator Johnson. Um, she's so, so shy and reserved in her comments. <laughs> Um, what Caddy said about, about the Coastal Caucus, uh, we, we do, uh, to, a large, to a large degree, um, we don't check politics at the door, we check 
party lines at the door. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and quite honestly, um, it's about issues that deal specifically with the coast. And our rule is if we are not all on board, it's not an issue we deal with. And, um, you know, so um, we operate by consensus. It's relatively easy to do because there's only seven of us. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the thing with the Coastal Caucus is it's, um, it, it is a group that um, probably carries more weight in the Legislative Assembly than any other, any other small group. Other, other parts of the legislature, like Multnomah County tried to create a Multnomah County caucus about six years ago, something like that, um, which absolutely fell apart. So, um, um, but you know, we do work and, and we work well. Um, you know, the issues we have been involved in over the years, probably, probably the, the biggest things we have been involved with is port dredging and issues like that and marine reserves and, um, and quite honestly our goal is to protect the economy of the coast. And, you know, Senator Johnson's, the topography of your part of the coast is different than mine. Um, you know, um, the North Coast does have flat land where you can build things. South Coast doesn't. Okay. Um, South Coast, um, our economy is timber and fishing. And now we can't cut trees. So what are we supposed to do? We really don't, we really don't have the land base or, or the infrastructure to branch out to become other things. We, we quite honestly don't. You know, some of the things, probably one of the biggest things that frustrated me this last legislative session was the fact that rather than deal with the Elliott State Forest in an appropriate way, because that forest is designed for sustainable harvest for the common school fund. And what did we do? We said we aren't going to touch it and we're going to borrow money for the common school fund based on the Elliott, okay? So we borrowed money on something we already own, okay? So we borrowed money to pay for something we own. I've, I, I still can't quite figure that one out, okay? But, you know, I was listening to the panel this morning and listening to Senator Dembro as he was talking about his constituents who are from downtown Portland and <clears throat> how they have a different view of the world. And a part of my problem is that view of the world seems to be dominating in a lot of places. It shouldn't be dominating, you know. Um, the fact is that Oregon has always been a natural resource-based state. When Oregon was at the top, you know, I'm from Douglas County. Doug, uh, Douglas County used to be called the timber capital of the nation, okay? There used to be a time back before Intel and Nike became what they were where Southern Oregon taxes were supporting Portland, okay? It's not that way anymore because we can't cut trees, we can't put our people to work, you know? Um, <clears throat> It, the problem with what we did with the Elliott, it, you know, it, it's a twofold thing here. Number one, that's one part of it, but the other part is, is the federal forest and the fact that we can't get into the ONC lands and cut trees there either in the federal forest, which by law is designed for sustainable timber harvest. By law, it's in federal law, and yet we're not doing it. Um, we, ha we have accomplished a couple things in the last couple years. We, we've been helping get the, the cannery industry back reestablished, and, and, that, and that's very, po very positive. Um, we, um, you know, when we, did, when we did marine reserves, what, six years ago now? Um, uh, Senator Johnson and I basically wrote the bill. And because um, the, the original plan was um, to lock up about 30% of the ocean in marine reserves, okay? Our plan locked up, what, 3%? <coughs> yeah, it locked up 3% for 10 years. We're coming up a couple years from that anniversary where we'll, where we'll take a look and see if we've got the science behind it. But uh, from my perspective, the number one priority of our ocean is to let our people go out and catch fish, okay? That's been there forever, and it needs to continue to be there forever. Um, 
uh, the, probably another priority, specifically coastal and, and south coast, is is the Port of Coos Bay and what we can do to make the Port of Coos Bay a viable deep water port. I know issues like um, natural gas are somewhat controversial. The Jordan Cove pipeline, most of, most of that pipeline's in my Senate district. Okay, um, some of my people aren't very happy with it. <clears throat> but the fact is, if we're looking at, at, at spurring rural economies and getting them going again, um, the more we can expand the Port of Coos Bay as, as an economic driver of, of um, the Oregon coast, the better all of Southern Oregon will be. There's no question about that. So I'm, I'm unashamedly supportive of Jordan Cove. I have been from day one. and. Um, you know, but w w the one thing ab uh, about Jordan Cove and all the publicity that that comes with it is, it w it's a perfect example of how much misinformation is out there in the world, okay? And how easy it is for people to buy into misinformation, you know, about how this pipeline is going to be a total disaster and thousands of people are going to die. Okay, I would, I would suggest that anybody who thinks that, go to Klamath Falls and ask them how many people have died because that whole region is honeycombed with gas pipelines and nothing has ever happened, okay? You know, at some point, you know, in this age we live in now, you know, when I, when I first came in the legislature in 97, here's what we had as far in our, in our office. I was in, in the house at the time. What we had in our office for equipment was a typewriter and a telephone, okay? We've expanded a wee bit beyond that at this point, okay? And, and technology is wonderful, but I'm still trying to figure out how, you know, you, you can go on the internet and find out anything you want, and if you're lucky, some of what you find may actually be true, okay? Uh, you know, the question is, how do we get to the truth in all of this stuff? And unfortunately, a lot of people are, are buying into things that aren't true. And I think Jordan Cove is a perfect example of, of how that has been misrepresented as far as, as the risks and the impacts um, that that pipeline is going to do. Um, our, our biggest problem at this point in time, as far as rural-urban divide, is how do we get the right information to the people in the urban areas who think, um, now, because keep in mind, you go back to the East Coast and you talk to people back there, they think we're on the verge of cutting down the last tree on the West Coast, okay? That's an absolute fact, okay? They think we have totally devastated our forests. You know, you try to tell them there are more trees growing in Oregon now than there was 100 years ago, they won't believe you, but it's true, okay? But bringing that back to home is uh, the biggest challenge I think we have is how do we get the right message to the urban people who have all the good intentions in the world but are basing their positions on misinformation? And if anybody has an answer as to how to do that, please let me know because I'm just a dumb country boy and I can't figure that one out. Senator, hopefully in the course of this conversation we can begin to answer some of those questions. As you can all tell, Thursday mornings at 7 o'clock when we gather every week while we're in session, we have very interesting and rousing discussions. <laughs> it's never dull in the Coastal Caucus meetings. Next, I would like to welcome and introduce our colleague, uh, Representative John Huffman. Representative Huffman represents House District 59. He's an active member of the Dalles Area Chamber of Commerce. He's served on its Economic Development Committee for many, many years and has served in the legislature for how many terms, John? Uh, <coughs> next month is 10 years. 10 years. I was appointed midterm, so. And so five terms. Yeah, <laughs> just getting started. Well. As part of his role there um, at, in the Economic <laughs> Development Committee, he's helped attract Google to the Port of the Dalles, which is a, a huge significant win for that part of the state, as well as help to develop the National Scenic Area, Area Discovery Center. Uh, Representative Huffman is an appointee to the Bi-State Advisory Council and has operated several businesses, including a radio station and, a, and is a pear farmer. Um, he's also a veteran, and sir, thank you very much for your service. Representative John Huffman.
thank you, Caddy, and thank everybody. It's good to be with you. I don't know if anybody had the same response that response or reaction that I did. I, I've seen most of you in the room, the last time we saw each other was July 7th. Uh, that was a significant day in my life, uh, ending a long period of the 2017 legislative session. So when I saw most of you coming into the room, we had worked together a lot over the last six months, and, and I had a little jerk. I don't know if anybody picked up on that or not. It, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, Jim, or or, a, or, or AP or any, no. <laughs> We, we did some great work. Um, you know, Jeff talked about the Coastal Caucus, and I'm the only legislator up here that, that doesn't represent any of the coast, and I'm not a member of the Coastal Caucus. Uh, but he, he did talk about they leave their political affiliation at the door. And I've always tried to do the same thing at the legislature. And I explain it like this. Betsy and I had lunch one day with a couple of legislators from Washington. And I told the story about a constituent that said, I always see your name in the paper for something or another, and, and there's always an R behind your name. And I have no idea, what does that R stand for? And I said, reasonable. <laughs> it's, <coughs> it's, and D would be different. There's a quote. <laughs> it's, it's, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Senator Cruz said that, not he me. Did. <laughs> so, um, there are a number of people in the room doing some really good things for, for rural Oregon. And I appreciate it. I represent Wasco, uh, Jefferson, all of northern Deschutes County and Wheeler County. And so it's, uh, you know, when you start getting out into frontier Oregon, um, used to represent Sherman County, Mike MacArthur, and uh, that got taken away from me in 2011. Bummer of a deal, but that's every 10 years we do redistricting. Uh, some of the good work that has been done, and I really want to thank Duncan and Jeremy um, for the Oregon business plan and the emphasis the last a lot of years uh, on rural Oregon and making sure that rural Oregon is a part of the, the Oregon business plan. I really appreciate that. And a couple of years ago at the Leadership Summit, uh, a number of you were probably there and heard um, Representative Mike McLean ask the question about, do you believe there's a crisis in rural Oregon? And he went on to say that he felt there was and that we needed to recognize that there was a crisis before we could actually implement plans to do something about it. And I believe, like Mike, that there is a crisis in rural Oregon, economic, um, the, the economics of it impact families. Um, it's, you know, when you start looking at the, the, the lagging educational indicators, the lagging financial indicators, uh, poverty and food insecurity, and on and on and on, the list of things that we're famous for in rural Oregon that nobody wants to be famous for. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the, um, it was the employment landscape for rural Oregon uh, study that came out recently. And here are just kind of a rundown of some of the challenges that rural Oregon is going through right now. After seven years of uneven economic recovery, 17 out of Oregon's 23 rural counties remain below peak employment. Rural areas of Oregon have higher unemployment rates and less diverse economies than metro areas. This leaves them more vulnerable to economic shocks and recessions. The Great Recession was worse in many rural Oregon counties than the metro Oregon area. Nationally, the recession lasted from 2007 until June of 2009, but recovery continues today in many rural Oregon counties. The jobs that have returned to non-metro counties have been largely low wage, while jobs in high wage industries remain below pre-session rural levels. And <clears throat> it goes on and on and on. I'm not gonna um, hammer on all, all, on all the details, and I don't mean to point that out to complain, but they're facts that we have to deal with in rural Oregon. And I've always been a believer. I don't know how many of you remember when Jim Osimano uh, ran the Office of Rural Policy for um, Governor Kulangoski. He always talked about interdependence. 
And I met Jim early on. He's a Hood River guy, and so we knew each other anyway. <clears throat> but I always have tried to do my best to educate folks on that, the interdependence. <clears throat> rural needs metro, metro needs rural. Um, there's an interdependence there, and, and it's it, early in my legislative career, there was a unnamed legislator that uh, walked up to me in between Ways and Means meetings, and she said, you know, John, my constituents in Portland are sick and tired of sending their taxes out to help your constituents have 24-7 police coverage. Well, we don't have 24-7 police coverage, first of all, but it really struck a chord with me. I thought, wow, there's a divisiveness and a lack of understanding in that message. Um, do you realize that when your constituents from Portland come to recreate in the Gorge or Central Oregon, they expect to have hospitals, they expect to have um, OSP uh, at a moment's notice if they run into trouble, uh, search and rescue has to be well-funded, alive and well, and they're not. Uh, they dig into, most of our sheriffs dig into their, their general fund to um, be able to go rescue people from Smith Rock or uh, the Columbia River or wherever else. And so there's, that's just one example of the interdependence that goes on. Uh, the connections between uh, rural Oregon agriculture and the Port of Portland. I mean, it, you can, the list is long and it goes on and on. And so I've tried to work very hard in educating and collaborating on um, on ideas, and so on the educational part, it, it takes a lot of different forms. But last year, uh, Representative Cliff Bentz and I invited Speaker Kotek out to our districts uh, to to visit and take some tours and just kind of explain what some of our challenges are in rural Oregon. And um, we carried that message with Tina's help into this last legislative session. And Cliff and I both got some really good things done for our district because Tina came out with a listening ear and she helped us get some really good things done. Uh, it, was a, it was a challenging session in a lot of ways. And how many people in the room work for the governor? My, my friend, okay, so. You know, I, I love Kate and I love all you guys, and so when you take this message back, be, be, be gentle. <laughs> be kind, be kind. But, you know, I had a lot of people visiting my office uh, early in the session, and the governor's budget had pointed out a number of hits to rural Oregon, uh, whether it was a call center in Baker City or the closure of an OIA facility in Warrenton, mm -hmm. uh, the proposed closure of the crime lab in Pendleton, and there were a number of high profile um, closures on, on the chopping block. And, uh, and yet the governor was talking about the, the support for rural Oregon, and, and I said, that's, that's not the kind of help we need. Um, and at, at the end of session, you know, fast forward to the end of July, and rural Oregon did get some stuff. I got the Madras Airport bill. Uh, Daimler is expanding at the Madras Airport uh, in a phenomenal way. And that's one example. Um, there was the Eastern Oregon Economic Development Region that was set up, and so I mean, there were some really good things done. But it seemed like for every good thing that was done, there was, there was a, another thing taken away over here. And so I, I thought all session about, about that, and the last few weeks of session, um, the governor's chief of staff, Nick Blosser, made the mistake of finding my office, and, and so he frequented <laughs> it. I'm not sure why after the, the punishment, but you know we had a good visit. He had a lot of good visits. And I said, Nick, I would like for you to encourage the governor to reinstitute the Office of Rural Policy. And he thought about it for a minute and he said, well, you know, we have regional solutions. And I said, absolutely, I'm very supportive of regional solutions um, and have encouraged many folks in my district to be uh, participating members, whether it's the Central Oregon region or North Central uh, that Mike MacArthur uh, co-convenes for us. 
doing some really good stuff. But I said it's different from policy level discussions. And so I wanted to throw that out uh, for everybody here to be thinking about because a lot of you have constituencies in rural Oregon, whether it's Farm Bureau or, or whomever, um, AOC. And I think there, I think it's time and I think there's room to have an office of rural policy so that when the governor's office is developing a budget and there is an idea like closing a call center in Baker City, if the work has been done on rural policy, maybe it would inform that decision a little better and explain what the ramifications of that could be. And uh, maybe we wouldn't have some of those decisions that we have to deal with in a legislative session if we could better think things through from a rural lens. And uh, so anyway, thank you. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> I think I wanna follow up just on a quick comment on what Representative Huffman just said. If you think about it, when a decision is made that impacts a handful of jobs or a facility or a closure in a rural community, those economies are much more fragile than our urban areas. So once you shut that down, um, it has a much larger impact on that fragile rural economy than it does in a, in a larger populated area. And so we take those hits very hard. Um, I had my staff do a little quick research this morning. And um, if you look at Oregon's unemployment rate now, I think the most current numbers, it's around 3.7%. In Senator Cruz's district, which is a large part of it, is Curry County, it's 5.3%. Coos County, 48 Douglas County, again, Senator Cruz, 47 Over in some of our pioneer counties, Grant County, 62 Crook County, 55 Lake County, 54 You can see from those numbers that many of these rural communities, coastal and on the interior, have been in a recession not for a handful of years, but some of them for 30 or 40 years, and they're not recovering very well. And that's just an indicator of why we need to continue to have these conversations and create these very important partnerships um, where all of Oregon can benefit from uh, this economic recovery that's being experienced in areas, some areas and not others. Okay, Caddy, keep in mind, those numbers don't tell the true picture, and we all know that, because once you have run out of benefits, you're no longer counted. And, and I would suggest that we have counties with double digit. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Denny Doyle. We're very happy to have you here, sir. Um, uh, president Doyle has been Beaverton's mayor since 2009. He's president now of the League of Oregon Cities and mayor of the city of Beaverton. So he's carrying a very large load right now and we're grateful for his service. Prior to being mayor, um, Mr. Doyle spent 14 years serving um, on Beaverton City Council. Um, currently serves on a variety of local, regional, and national boards and committees, including League of Oregon Cities and the National League of Cities Board. So he's, he's um, doing a wonderful job for us in Oregon, and we appreciate it very much. Mayor Doyle, thank you for being here. Thank you. You said we had 20 minutes, right? I'm just, just kidding, just kidding. As much as you like. No, I'm just teasing. Yeah, no. But I, I do want to start, start off with a thank you to the men and women of the state house and the state senate for trying to do a marvelous thing or two, not perfect for everybody, but what you accomplished in this session is, it's gonna be noted in the history books. You started, I don't think we all know what you really have done in the long term, but I think it's gonna be exciting to see what happens. And the best part is, I do get to go to the other end of the world um, after four months of going back looking for who can make decisions, I still haven't found them yet with the new <laughs> regime. I mean, keep at it. <laughs> so I'm trying, but you made me very proud. When I go back there, I can brag about what you all did this time. So I just wanted to extend a thank you from the entire group of cities, 280 some, whatever the right number is, Wendy. 241. Um, thank you very much for doing your job and checking your differences at the door for the most part. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to see, and it's not happening all over this country, so I want to commend you all for that. So, okay. Um, as she said, that I'm the mayor of Beaverton as well as the uh, League of Cities president, and actually Beaverton's kind of unique. It's the only strong mayor form of government in the state, so I don't have a city manager to have to talk to, uh, except myself and my wife. But, uh, so, 
in all seriousness, starting this year, I took eight trips around the state and got to see what's really going on outside of this little hub that I live in. And uh, it was a very, very good tour for me. We were teaching newly electeds, are you crazy for taking these jobs as city councilors? And also how to do the job. But the best thing for me is I got to see what was going on or what was not going on in the rest of the state. But we all are struggling with affordable housing, workforce housing, transportation and infrastructure needs, land use challenges, telecommunications, infrastructure, public employment costs, i.e. PERS, and much, much more. And the fascinating thing is everybody, at, to some degree, has got the same challenges. Uh, maybe not all the, the same. The different, the different buckets may be up and down, but they're all there. And uh, we really have to start to think across our metro boundaries, our county boundaries, about how we can help each other and advocate for each other to level the playing field and open doors to opportunity for all. And I certainly hope Scapoose helps us start that. <laughs> um, we need to push for tools that help us across the state we need to think about the resources we bring to the table to help each other. I've had long conversations with Greg Walden in D.C. Uh, we very much, I said, I'm coming in as president. What can I do to help your constituents? I want to talk about three key areas that, uh, that I see today. The first is innovation and entrepreneurship. In Beaverton, we have a great example of how we can work together to support business development. The city is a sponsor of a local nonprofit startup incubator called OTBC, and it's easier than saying Oregon Technology Business Center. We've been at this for 10 to 12 years now. We've got some other programs that are going. I'm going to just talk about one. It provides expert coaching and mentoring to startups. In 12 years, it has helped launch 80 new companies, generating more than $30 million in annual revenue to this point. It also has a VIP program to, to support rural entrepreneurship. It, this is what I think is, is germane to the conversation here. It targets entrepreneurs in rural Oregon building traded sector businesses. They are able to participate in an eight-week series of workshops via live interactive video and receive twice a, uh, a month mentoring online. It's affordable. It's all $79. So if you're, you're back in your district and say you want some help, and we have some really smart retired business guys from you know Intel and, and Nike and Columbia, all those companies up there. They're there to help, and they love it. They love to see somebody become successful. Uh, also, we just received a three-year grant from Oregon Community Fund to expand the capacity, thanks to Jim McCright. Um, we think it is an innovative example of how we can reach out across the state without getting in a car, work together, and grow our shared economy base. What's good for Garibaldi or Florence is good for Beaverton. The second area I want to talk about is placemaking. The reality is as much as we love our individual cities, as much as we treasure our individual community assets, people choose to call Oregon home for the whole state, not just one part of the state. We can go anywhere and fish. We can go anywhere do things, but we really have to remember that, and it, it leads to, a, a, I think, a, even a, a more important point. People live in Beaverton Valley that they're so close to the Oregon coast, or to the mountains, or to the desert. They're just short drives away. I can actually go see stars in less than two and a half hours. That's kind of special. The more our communities stand out as destinations, each and every one of ours, the more we stand together in a shared network of economic growth, businesses in the Portland metro area need to attract a workforce who long for the amenities and lifestyle the state brings to the table. It really does help recruit. And we can build on that. We must support each other's efforts to fund and promote community development, housing support, and transportation. If the coast can't attract a workforce because of housing, cha housing challenges, then that's not just a coastal issue. That is a statewide issue because of our shared connections. This leads me to my final point. I'm trying to be brief, which is the diversity and the economic benefits of embracing this strength called diversity. Beaverton was recently, you have to get a brag in if you're a mayor, at least one brag, was named uh, one of the top 10 places to live in America for small cities. It was, they used 83 criteria, talked to 400 different cities, and it was done by Money Magazine, and the city does not advertise in the magazine. Um, <laughs> so we got a phone call, gosh, in, in June, July, that we, they were being considered for the top 50, and they, we didn't know if they sent a, a writer out to check us out. Well, that happened in the night of our, our night market. Um, and this is a kind of a celebration of the diversity of the city. And we knew about 7,000, people there. And she also went down and saw the uh, community market and looked at how we were doing our outreach, our bowl programs, how we're trying to bring people from all over the world into city government, into city panels. And she said, that just knocked her editor's socks off. 
One in five people living in Beaverton was not born in the U.S. One of three is a person of color. Sixth grade is now this year, next year was sixth grade. The, the whites will be the minority students in the, in the school system, the third largest school system in the state, and we love it. So I've made it a priority of my administration to talk about a diverse community and support ways to celebrate this as a strength. A few years back, we formed a diversity advisory board, and this is all volunteers. They came, some came out of our bold program where we tried to let people know it's okay to become part of government, nothing bad will happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna lie like What's that? I looking at you? Okay. Um, anyhow, they, they sat down and said, what can we do? They actually changed our helped us change our purchasing policies, put, we're, we're now, everything we put out as a, as a government is at least nine to 10 languages. And um, they decided to create a community event, now I've, I've hinted at it, it's the International Light Market, Celebrate all of our cultures, there's many who want to participate. Good food. Listen to great music and showcase our local diverse entrepreneurs and actually help them make a few, few dollars. So in year three, this last event was last Saturday and the, the uh, cash, you know, bringing these portable cash machines out there, they ran out of money. So I think all the vendors there were very happy. So this, this last year we welcomed 14,000 people. But this is something any community can copy and do. And we'd be, our, our, if you come and ask our advisory people to come help you, they'll be in heaven and they'll be there until you get it done. And uh, so our goal was really to help small entrepreneurs there. So my message is really simple. While our values in Beaver may, be, you know, may be to celebrate diversity, it also makes really good business sense. Entrepreneurs are the lifeblood of our, of our economy. This is a lesson we can easily take across the state. Figure out your community strengths, how to support your economic strategies, borrow, i.e. steal, every good idea you can from any city you happen to go upon. And today we have more partners, more vendors, and people who want to get involved with the market. These goals tie our city together, and in a larger way, tie our state together. We're, we are all one Oregon, and it is a worthy notion. We must be committed to celebrating our differences and treasure those, but be nimble to support programs and resources that enable strengths of individual communities and people and small business folks. We, you know, this is a point I, I make everywhere where I go if I get time to talk. We are all now part of a world community, which is bringing us closer every day. Every day we're alive in many ways, and some are gonna be invented tomorrow. But if, if our state doesn't understand how to actually effectively participate in the world economy, we're gonna regret that. And been pushing that for, for, for you know, quite a number of years. And I I internationally, we are like, especially in Asia, and uh, we need to take advantage of that. There are business opportunities now, new ones will be coming, and the rural and urban areas have to learn how to take advantage of that. Partnerships are a great way to do this, and I just think we have to be ready to see them, seize them, and get the U.S. back on top of the world economy. Other than that, I have no passion. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Doyle. While the mayor was speaking, I had this vision come into my head of contrast. Um, the, the, the issues that are dealt with, particularly I think in Washington County, where growth is something that has, has, has got to be a part of the strategy. How do you deal with this incredible growth? How do you deal with these opportunities that are being presented? In my community, the population has been static for 30 years. It's a county of 62,000 people. Uh, when I graduated high school, we had 2,000 students in our high school, a very robust economy. Everybody had a job that could support a family. We now have 700 students in our high school. We're one of the three poorest counties in the state with the highest per capita murder rate, highest rates of diabetes, obesity, teen smoking. Uh, and, and all of those social issues are there because we are poor. And we're poor because the economic vitality that once was part of our community is no longer there. So we are just facing such different challenges than you face um, when you're trying to build new schools to keep up with an influx of hundreds and hundreds of students a year. It's very different than not being able to pass a bond levy to replace a 75-year-old school that's falling down. Uh, so I just the contrast as you were speaking became very stark to me when you, when you make that urban-rural contrast in, in some parts of our state. Uh, again, that's one of the things we want to talk about today is how we change that. Um, next on our panel, we'll get to the nitty gritty of, of the representatives of our business community and how we begin to forge those relationships, I think, that can help uh, help all of us be successful. Sandra McDonough is president and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance. Uh, she served as president and CEO since 2004. Before that, she had an extensive career in the energy industry, working for both PGE Corporation and Pacific Corp. She 
She uh, has been a reporter for the Oregonian and the Seattle Times. So she sees the world um, differently than a lot of us do. Thank you very much. Um, she's currently serving on a number of boards, including Associated Oregon Industries. Uh, so maybe she could let us know what's happening with the reorganization. Um, Greater Portland, Inc., the International Women's Forum, New York Avenue for Youth, Travel Portland, the University of Oregon Alumni Association, and the U.S. National Bank Community Advisory Board. We're very lucky to have Sandra with us today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Candy. And I believe it's Sandy. Yes, Sandy. Or Sandy. Sandra, either one. Um, I feel like I should start by saying I'm from Portland and I'm here to help after all of this. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Thank you. But we I welcome it. it. Until I took this job and I was w in the energy industry for 20 years, I was actually with PG&E California uh, Corporation, the California-based company. I was actually paid to worry mostly about rural communities in the state because all of our assets and many of our customers were in rural Oregon. So we had a, a large focus on both the coast and central Oregon and um, southern Oregon as well. But I grew up here in Portland and as we've been speaking, I was thinking about the change in how uh, Portland and rural Oregon relate and it's really been profound if you think about it. Um, we've talked about rural-urban differences for as long as I can remember, but when I was a young person, even when I was starting my career, the towers in downtown Portland, a lot of them were built and occupied by natural resource-based industries, Georgia Pacific, Louisiana Pacific, a lot of others, and those companies aren't 100% absent from this city. Um, I have some that are members, thank you, but um, um, the, the presence of some of those industries that are so closely tied to the economies of rural Oregon is simply not what it used to be. So some of the innate connections that we had and the understanding that we were able to develop because we were all working together and serving on um, uh, boards together aren't there as much and it's a little bit more complex as we've seen how the economies have grown since um, the early 90s that we really in Portland have um, largely a tech-based economy and um, with the software industry growing and and companies that maybe don't have that innate intrinsic understanding and connection to uh, rural communities that that we used to see here in Portland. And so I think we've got to be mindful about how we work together to build that understanding and bring all of those people who are coming in droves to Portland and moving here, bring them along and help them see all of Oregon. We are very lucky that we still do have great companies based here that are statewide companies and who that do take a, a statewide approach. Pacific Power, my former employer, is one of them. The banks, U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, um, they all have a statewide vision and understand how important the a healthy rural economy is to our entire state and the connectivity that we have to drive between um, rural Oregon and particularly the Portland metro area. But I do want to point out when we talk about the economy, you know, of Portland Metro, we read in national papers and everywhere that our local economy is, is on fire. And that is true. There's lots of job creation going on. But the truth is that that, that new prosperity is not evenly shared across our region, that we have econ um, geographic regions, particularly East Portland, East Multnomah County, and some communities within our region that are not equally sharing that benefit. And I think if you went to East Multnomah County, you would see some communities that in terms of employment and um, incomes look a lot more like rural Oregon than they do like downtown Portland. And so we're trying to have that conversation and say, we've got to figure out how to share the prosperity that we have created in the central part of our, our city in, in Washington County, which is doing phenomenally well because of leadership from people like um, Mayor Doyle, to see that grow and to share that more broadly. And as I thought of, as I listened to this panel, I really, have, in other panels today, I've heard about issues that we care about here in Portland and that we, we share together and that the way I think we could be building understanding is finding ways to connect together on issues that we share, um, work on solutions together and understand that some solutions that might work for Portland 
might not work for rural communities. Sometimes we wish we didn't have them in Portland either, but that's, you know, we've got to figure out how this all works together. For example, um, workforce training, job development workforce training, how we, as we change from a manufacturing com um, e economy, how do we prepare people or manufacturing becomes different, how do we prepare our young people? Thank you, Senator Johnson, for OMIC. I think that is just a phenomenal, the scapoo space training program that she is spearheading that's going to be phenomenal for Scapoose. By the way, doesn't what? your district come over to Portland now, Senator Johnson? Into the working waterfront under we, the St. John's Bridge. We are so proud to call you one of ours. So thank you very much. We and, need you. And we, we need will be you here. We will be there, calling there on the senator. Right out there. <laughs> we, we will be calling you. on the senator to showcase that project before the end of this panel, just it, so you know. It's a phenomenal. But job development, we still have to be looking at job development at, throughout Oregon and in Portland. Housing, huge issue across our state. It's a critical issue here in Portland. But the solutions that we do, we need to be thinking statewide and how we can work together to create an environment for more housing development. Transportation, we um, have worked, we've done a few cost of congestion studies, um, working with Duncan and the business plan. And what we found is that congestion in the Portland metro area impacts the ability of um, people across the state, um, producers across the state to get their product to market and is a, a choking point, so we need to work together on transportation. I'm so glad you mentioned trade, Representative Huffman. That is, you know, we're a trade-based state. We need to, people in Portland need to understand that growing wheat in, Port, in uh, Pendleton or producing cheese in Tillamook, that's all trade and it all comes through Portland and we need to be working together on trade policies that benefit both economies. So, and small business development, which is the heart of our economy here and I think of every economy in the state. So. I think there are places where we can work together. Um, we have common issues. Maybe there are different solutions or solutions that are applied differently, but I think if we work together and, and frankly work together to understand, to build a better understanding with people across the state, um, rural people of some of the urban concerns and urban people of some of the uh, rural concerns. We've taken folks out around the state before, Duncan and I together, and um, we love doing that. So we may be calling you and saying we're coming to a community um, near you soon. Thank you. Well, we would welcome that certainly anytime. <laughs> And we're also very, very fortunate to have on our panel today Duncan Wise. Duncan is president of the Oregon Business Council and has uh, a storied history in the work that he's done um, with that organization. He's been there since 1995. OBC is a private nonprofit, nonpartisan organization whose members are principally chief executives at some of Oregon's largest enterprises. OBC focuses members' knowledge on public policy issues such as economic development, education, health care, transportation, and public finance. OBC is responsible for many statewide initiatives, including the Oregon Business Plan, and I hope, Duncan, you'll take just a moment and explain to us how that process works, and uh, of course, you know, a number of us have helped participate in that. Um, he also serves as the Executive Director of the Oregon Business Council Charitable Institute, so please help me welcome Duncan Wise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty, and thank you, panel. I mean, you've covered so much ground. I'm sure you have many questions. I will try to be brief, but I do want to have a, I have a few reflections. Um, first of all, I consider myself an Oregonian, not a person who li I happen to live in Portland, but I have spent most of my professional career focusing on the state as a whole. I've been to every county many times, and I really enjoy getting around to the state. And I, as Sandy mentioned, I have spent more have had more tours to different communities. I look at Mike here, we had a whole program that went on for three or four years where we just invited legislators and community leaders from one part of the state to go visit other parts. And always incredibly instructive and helpful. Um, as a Portlander, someone who lives in Portland, Portlander in that sense, and bringing Portlanders to other parts of the state, I, I just make a couple observations of what I always see when this happens. First of all, um, it's an eye-opener how effective 
communities typically are in in Oregon the smaller communities they seem to get things more get more things done more quickly than we seem to be able to do in Portland Sandy I don't know why that is but it's a lesson for us and frankly it's often very inspiring to go out to whether it's out to Mor Morrow County looking at the port or looking just anywhere in the state or the Dallas you name it um, I think it's important to reflect how good these communities are and how strong they are um, the other thing I would observe is I've gone around the state is what Sandy said. It has changed. The economies have changed. There's just no question, and, and, and Senator Cruz obviously highlighted it. Um, in Portland, there is less connection because of the change in the forest products industry than there once was. The Portland economy is diversified, and in fact, a lot of rural Oregon is diversified in different ways over the years, and that's important, and it's brought economic benefits. Um, at the same time, many communities are natural resource dependent. And what I found going out into those communities, when you get out to the forest, you look at water projects, what becomes really apparent for anyone from Portland looking at it in any amount of time is how wa much we're wasting our natural resources in the state. There are so many opportunities in Oregon to use natural resources more, more wisely, not just for the economy, but for the environment and for community and recreation and for all kinds of purposes. All you have to do is go look at the east side forests and see how unhealthy they are and how badly they need thinning. Same story down your way on the federal forests in southern Oregon. And we're wasting huge natural resources. Same story in water, same story across the board. If we would come recognize we need to come together in our, as a state and, and not, it's not environment versus the economy, it is natural resources for both. That's what we've got to get our mind around. Um, and, and until we can change that dialogue, I fear we're gonna have a really hard time on, on the whole issue of urban-rural divide. At the, one of the summits, I guess it was now two, three years ago, we brought the, the cross-laminated timber to the fore, and, and, and I, when I saw that opportunity, I just thought, here is an opportunity to bring <laughs> urban and rural back together. Cross-laminated timber is ecologically more sound for the environment. Um, it's an Oregon-based product. It could have employment in Portland, and it helps reconnect our forests to, and, and helps, I think, bring Portlanders to the understanding that our forests are an environmental asset, not something we should be you know, horrified that we have these forests. So we've got we've to find more opportunities, <laughs> whether it's in forestry or water, to, to take advantage of our natural resources. I think that's a very important issue as we move forward. To the business plan, um, I'm very proud of the work we've done in the business plan now for 16 years. I think many of you, I see many friends in the room, you mostly know what it is, but it is our a, a business-led coalition to put an economic strategy together for Oregon. When we started that first year, we went to every community in the state, and we've been doing that in different ways ever since. Um, at the summits, we try to raise issues that are common to all of us, as Sandy mentioned, and we also try to bring regionally specific opportunities to the table. I know many have said we don't pay enough attention to rural Oregon. I just have to tell you, Sandy constantly is kicking me. Where's Portland in this business summit? <laughs> there is not enough space for everything. So uh, just everybody feels like we've got to be, have our piece of the summit, and we, we try very hard to, to share everything. But I would say w the processes we've been using in recent years have been ever more effective. We have tried to go out to read regions individually and ask them to identify key priorities, working with regional solutions, and so whether it's the LNG terminal in, mm -hmm. in Coos Bay or um, Forest Health or the water projects around the state, infrastructure initiatives in, in eastern Oregon. Um, this year we brought the marine, um, the marine uh, opportunities, job opportunities to the fore and the workforce development um, from the Coastal Caucus meetings. We've been trying to get out to the, around the state and listen deeply to the individual regions, thanks to and Kubish and the Ford Family Foundation, we've got a grant to bring John Audley on, who's going to be doing more work reaching out into the rural communities to learn okay. your specific issues and, again, to bring sp um, specific opportunities to the fore. Where we find the summit is a place to advance ideas, advance policy initiatives, and for us, it's really, really important to carry the whole state behind the, the plan. Um, uh, Mayor Doyle talks about innovation. The other thing I would just stress as we look at the state and look at where we're going, we are innovating in every sector, whether it's forestry, ag, and we've got to make sure that innovation is spread in every sector. That's just the, the reality of, of, of the world where it's an intensely competitive economic environment and innovation will be you know, absolutely central to every region and frankly diversification uh, of the economies. And so each region in my perspective has different opportunities to take advantage of innovation and diversification and our challenge is to come together as Oregonians to spot those opportunities 
and to recognize our common interests, but also what the difference is in our regions and, and take advantage of those. It's, again, it's a lot of work, but if we come together, I think we can be very successful as Oregonians. Thanks. Thank you, Duncan. I think since since Duncan's comments, I want to follow up on that with just a couple of questions. And one of them has to do with the, the, the reorganization of these entities that I, are, are coming together mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it would be interesting, I think, if you could talk about sure. that just a little bit and see where that's headed. And then how can we, those of us who represent more rural communities, get involved to ensure that rural priorities get an equal interest in this new world that we're entering with this merger? Sure. Um, so for those who don't know, and the ABCs of the business community, and Sandy can help me here, as I think you probably know, the two um, bus statewide business associations, Associated Oregon Industries and the Oregon Business Association, have merged. Um, it will be the statewide advocacy organization for business in the legislature. They will have a team of lobbyists representing business interests on a whole range of, of public policy issues. All of the major business associations come together around the Oregon Business Plan. Is this not? Oh, I'm sorry. Around the Oregon. Closer. Oh, sorry. Uh, around the Oregon Business Plan, um, Sandy and her board chair. We have other regional boards represented. We have the o now the OBI board chair and executive. We're all represented on the business plan, and we, that's where we come together around economic strategy and the broad policy agenda. We expect OBI to translate that policy and agenda into specific legislative asks and advocacy. And I think what you're going to see is a more effective united business community out of this work is, is fundamentally what I think where we're going. And as part of that structure, that we are building out regional capacity to make sure we're hearing the specific issues from each region so we can inform the policy debate at the state level um, on, on those regional issues. We're doing that both through the business plan and the way they're organized in that new business Great. association. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Sandy. <laughs> We come together um, very successfully around the business plan, and we have a set agenda. And you know, in my job working for the Portland Chamber, I'm kind of I'm paid to worry about this metro area primarily. But when we set a set of priorities under the business plan for all of Oregon, including rural Oregon, those become my priorities as well. So I'm out there speaking for rural Oregon, and we're together. And I have a request. Every year we organize a trip to Washington, D.C. under the business plan. My organization actually does the, the planning for that. We would love to have um, more people representing the coast and all of um, rural Oregon with us on, on those trips. We have a very clear rural agenda as part of those trips every single time. And uh, we have great meetings with the legislators. We talk about things like fire suppression and, and water management and other things that are really important to rural Oregon. We'd love to have um, folks more engaged with that. If I could. If I could, just, just a comment, Duncan. Um, I don't want you to give people the impression that <clears throat> this new organization is the only organization representing business okay. interest, um, because there are still a lot of others. And, and, we're, we're, and we're quite honestly, you're kind of still in the norming forming stage. And it, it's going to be interesting to see how all this fits together. My sense is that by the next long session, you'll be on the ground fully running by that point in time. Yeah. That's absolutely right. It's Senator it's Johnson. If I Senator, would you mind taking a couple of minutes? And we haven't had a chance to get up to speed on home and get sure. Can you sure. Talk let me just make a comment about the business organizations, and I've said this in other forums. There has not been, in my opinion, a unified voice for business in the legislature. You've got OBA, PBA, AOI, OBC, EIEIO. Nobody knows who talks for business. <laughs> and my one hope is that this newly organized uh, group will help coalesce that single voice for business. Um, many of us have yearned for the legislature to do whatever it is, specifically tax or new revenue, with the business community, not to the business community. And it's been hard to not have a partner across the table. Um, before I talk about OMIC, it would be my pleasure to acknowledge a great rural Oregonian, former Speaker of the House, Bruce Hanna, oh. who hails from rural Oregon and was a wonderful speaker. <laughs> Well, Cruz says okay, so, you know. <laughs> um, the other... Th 
The other thing is that given that this is a coastal caucus, two of our colleagues are in the room, Representative Boone and Representative Gomberg, who was in the back of the room, and, Rep and uh, Senator uh, Roblin, who of course uh, has had so many penoir duties that he isn't with us today, but I just felt that it was incumbent upon us to acknowledge our, our uh, colleagues. Um, OMIC is a wonderful, serendipitous opportunity to bring metal manufacturing, advanced metal manufacturing across a bunch of disciplines in, back into Oregon. Uh, we have now launched our uh, membership agreements. We have, uh, as our inaugural um, uh, partners, Boeing, Silver Eagle Manufacturing, Vigor, ATI, Blount, Daimler. Daimler's been mentioned twice today, and I want to come back and just comment on Daimler for a second. Uh, we have Hangstafer, which is a synthetic lubricant company heretofore only on the East Coast, now coming out to Oregon for their North American west, uh, west part of the uh, United States uh, service center. We are already recruiting the largest uh, cutting tool company in Japan that was looking at Seattle and is now seriously looking for their North American presence to be here. OMIC is not a Columbia County, even a, an Oregon uh, asset. It is a regional and I dare say a national asset. Boeing has helped stand up 14 of these worldwide. This is the first one in the United States. We were very fortunate that the legislature saw the investment opportunity here and has given us enough money to get up and fully functional. We come to the table with $12 million, give or take, of already donated equipment. And it isn't because these national and international companies like us so much. It is the promise, the hope, of getting into Boeing's supply chain. Boeing has 1,600 union employees in Gresham and the biggest book of business in the history of the world. And in order to stay competitive, because many of these are fixed price uh, 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 contracts, they have to do whatever they do, greener, faster, cleaner, better. Uh, they don't have time to shut down the plant out in Gresham to do the R&D. So through a serendipitous set of circumstances, including a 10-year battle to bring 200 acres into the UGB, we have uh, property ready to build. We have patient capital landlords that own big tracts of property. We celebrated day before yesterday a $480,000 contribution to this effort. OIT, in an act of unbelievable political courage, bought a building out in Scappoose that has become the anchor facility. It's a 38,000 square foot building built as a truck shop, so it is perfect for doing what we're doing. Uh, we have as our academic partners OIT, PSU, OSU, the University of Sheffield in an Anglo-English partnership, hands across the ocean, and PCC is our academic facility. Some of the early projects, uh, Duncan commented on the waste of natural resources. One of the early projects that we're going to be doing R&D on, and this is R&D that can be instantly commercialized. We're not writing master's or PhD theses. We are putting this into the supply chain, is to stop the hemorrhaging of water. When we talk about old pipes in the United States, we talk about pipes that are maybe wooden pipes over in eastern Oregon, a couple of hundred years old. When London talks about old pipes, they talk about the Middle Ages. Every day, t gallons of water hemorrhage out of London. So one of the early Anglo-English partnerships is going to be a company, and I will now demonstrate to you how little I know about engineering, but it is a company that has a material that ostensibly goes into a manhole in a flaccid state and then has has magic engineering dust sprinkled on it and it becomes rigid in situ. So instead of having to tear up the streets, they functionally seal the pipe where it is. And we've been talking to a, uh, an Oregon entrepreneur about the possibility of putting little devices inside the pipe that can actually generate electricity as the water moves through. <laughs> so you preserve the resource, you generate electricity, you don't have to tear up the streets. And this will be one of our early Anglo-English partnerships. Uh, we believe we're off to a terrific start. So with our partners, if it flows, if it floats, flies, or freights, we want to make it cleaner, greener, faster, better, and we want an Oregon manufacturing imprimatur on every single thing that comes out of this facility. No passion there. The 
one thing, though, that I do want to say about Daimler, because Daimler's expanding in Columbia County that will have a ripple effect here and help Boeing. They're also in Madras, and I couldn't have been a bigger fan of that airport. Airports are catalytic economic engines in the communities where they're located. Um, but we've got to treat our corporate citizens well. We have got to make this a community that welcomes our corporate citizens. And in my opinion, we have tinkered around a little too much with some of those business relationships inside corporations. We want Daimler to look at this place and say, this is the right spot. We need to be in Madras. We can flourish and grow here. We need to be in Columbia County. And I think the legislature has to exercise a certain amount of caution to make sure that we welcome our corporate partners, that we're not simply looking at them as a source of revenue. Yep. Absolutely. Senator, you have been with the Bay and Tarleton and... Oh, oh, the light went out. Better. Absolutely. I think this one got tired and died. Um, I was appointed to the Port Commission by Governor Kulingoski in 2004 and have been observing the permitting process for the Jordan Cove Energy Project now for almost 14 years. And if you talk about a company who has been patient and has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in Oregon without turning a shovel of dirt, continuing to get the message that they are unwelcome is very, very difficult for those of us who live in some rural communities that need these investments. Uh, we think this is something that we need to work on. And so, Senator Johnson, I appreciate you opening the door to that conversation. This will be a $7 billion private investment with no government subsidies. They're not asking for anything. They're exceeding the bar on every permit that they've been asked to submit. Uh, and we have created an environment that's very, very difficult. And I just think it's important that we acknowledge that. Uh, we don't always do that. But um, it, for a community like mine, it will double the assessed value of my county when it's finished. And we are one of the three poorest counties in the state. Um, so I think these things are important to acknowledge. And as we move forward, I know, Duncan, you've asked me to come and update on this project at the Business right. Summit now for how many years? Several, it's probably right. the yeah. most well-vetted federal project that's ever been done on the West Coast. Yeah. So, but, but, Caddy, this, you know, for the Port of Coos Bay, for all of Southern Oregon, um, this is absolutely huge. It's, it's the start of something that could be <clears throat> very much bigger with a little more activity. I know that Port does have the ability <clears throat> with a couple other things happening to get private financing to make the short line a class one the whole way, which which is a game changer for all of Southern Oregon. I mean, what happens in the Port of Coos Bay isn't just Coos County, it's all of Southern Oregon that benefits. And it's a, it's a regional impact, as yes. Senator Johnson was talking about. Um, I want to come back to Representative Huffman one more time. You brought up the issue of reestablishing the Office of Rural Policy. Could you talk a little bit more about that? You brushed by it a little bit, but it's something that, that may be of interest to the folks in the audience, and then we'll open up to questions. It, it's the thoughts are kind of in their infancy as uh, Nick has been kind of pressing me to explain what my vision of an office of rural policy would be. Um, but it, it kind of solidified as I mentioned toward the end of session I was reflecting on all of the policy suggestions f not just from the governor's office but also from individual legislators and so every other year, you know, for the big session, we get together and we have this real shotgun approach. I, I come and I represent my district and I've got a handful of economic development projects. In the interim, I wear another hat and I'm working with Duncan on bringing blue zones to the Dalles and, uh, you know, on and on and on, but it's a real shotgun approach. And I think that Oregon could benefit, not just rural Oregon, but I think Oregon could benefit from an office of rural policy mm -hmm. where the director or advisor to the governor in that office could, you know, be traveling around the state with John Audley and, uh, you know, visiting rural Oregon and finding out what the priorities are, what the needs are. How does that interface with Portland? How does that interface with the port? Where are the challenges? Uh, why do we have these challenges? What can we do about them? That's more of a policy level statewide approach rather than regional solutions. 
which I'm extremely supportive of and, and make sure that all of my folks in Central and North Central are plugged into that from the community college presidents to county commissioners to make sure that everybody is involved because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful tool for a region for all these folks to come together and compare notes. But an office of rural policy would be a statewide higher level approach. Um, USDA rural development, is Jill still in the room? Yep, there she is. Um, Jill's doing a, a great job as acting director for rural development for USDA, but um, having a point person in the governor's office that Jill could go to and, and work with, or the person in the governor's office go to Jill and say, hey, we've got, we've got all of this um, that we want to accomplish from you know, DLCD to ODOT to Business Oregon to you know, all of the state agencies that have their fingers in um, major policy decisions that affect rural Oregon and the potential economic growth or decline, depending on you know, how, it, how the approach is taken. And I just think it could be a really powerful tool um, for, the, for the state uh, and for the governor to be able to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm putting action to my words. I really do support uh, rural Oregon. But, but again, the interdependence and the impact that it could have on the metro area uh, also could be extremely powerful. Thank you. I think we'll open it up to questions. I don't know. Is there another mic out here somewhere? Or do we need to grab yeah. one of these? Yeah. Well, then we'll share this. Since I got it, can I ask a question? You can go first, Mike. <laughs> the privilege yeah. of possession well, of the I, mic. I think uh, what uh, Senator Johnson's done, tremendous work around OMIC out there, sort of begs another question. And as I understand OMIC, and part of what that's doing is preparing a workforce to work in those industries. And it seems to me, from what I hear, that there's a tremendous gap in how we're preparing workers, how we're training folks to work in new industries. And I'm curious from the whole panel where you see those gaps are and what you think might, might be done about that. We uh, Time's up. Four o'clock bell. Ah, there we go. Does that tell us something serious or should we keep going? Is it a car alarm? Can you see out? I think it's a car okay. alarm. Thank you. We talked about this at some length yesterday. And uh, at, the, at the most foundational level of problem, we have collectively over the last three decades so devalued career and technical education. If your child comes home and says, I'd like to be a welder, they're prying open the second floor windows to jump out. Um, the fact of the matter is my husband and I needed to get a plumber on a Saturday uh, a few months ago. When we got the bill, we didn't want to buy stock in the company. We just wanted to pay for the service. Um, we need to put value back into these career and technical jobs. And remember that it takes an, a brilliant architect to design a building. It takes a brilliant contractor and the trades to build the building. And so uh, we have to teach not only the hard skills of math and, and the basic fundamentals of the science that goes along with many of these career and technical. We need to start at a younger age. Many of us are of a certain age and head shop or home ec. Uh, that's not so much anymore. We are focusing on CTE in the high school years. I think if there's an opportunity to introduce even younger kids and to see the magic of a mill now that used to burn waste and now with computer-aided cutting uses every single piece of the wood, the bark, everything. So it's a matter of revaluing these jobs, of understanding that it's not just the hard skills, it's also the soft skills. Eight o'clock isn't a guideline, that's the time we go to work. And you work a full day and you go home when the boss says you go home. So we've got to start reintroducing these skills and making sure that we hold the kind of work done by these technicians in high regard and high value. 
um, it, it, it's curricula, it's attitude, it's mentors, it's uh, the equipment in the, in the classes. There's a terrific facility in the Salem uh, Kaiser School District that is a former food processing plant brought by a very wealthy entrepreneur who has turned that into a career technical academy with uh, five or seven disciplines and they're just about to add a couple of more all the way from welding, cosmetology, they want to add drone technology. Um, it's a beautiful facility. It's clean, it's attractive, and it makes the kids want to come there and come away with either terminal certificates or the demonstration of skill to go right into a workplace. And I will conclude by saying I was out talking to some of the apprentices at Boeing, and a young woman who was a welder came in, and I just said to her, how's this working out for you? And she said, I'm making 42 bucks an hour. My friends are saying you want fries with that. Yeah, qu quite honestly, this is not, Senator Roblin and I have been working on some restructuring of our education system, and this will feed very well into that because, quite honestly, the trade schools and community colleges have been a poor stepchild in the education system. You know, we've been, for a decade now, we've been kind of focused on this quote unquote 40 40 20 model of education, which means that 40% of our kids, if we're doing it right, get a baccalaureate degree. That's not where the jobs are. Okay, that is not where the good paying jobs that Betsy was just talking about. You don't need a baccalaureate degree to be a welder. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so we are in the process of trying to reshift some of the focus and and see if we can get more people into the appropriate training to get the jobs that are out there if we could find the people with the training to do them. Thank you. J just another thought. Um, you know, I've been doing this elected stuff for a long time and I'm married to an educator, a principal, good stuff. So education is important. You, we really need to look at, in terms of education pre-K, we got to have five-year-olds arrive in kindergarten with a word capacity that my kids were blessed to have because they had a mom and dad that read to them. The other side is from the business community, i really tired of hearing about we can't find the workers we need in Oregon, regardless of what, the, why can't we sit down with the business and the Department of Education, the state of Oregon, and figure it out? It's been 30 years and I've heard the same thing. <laughs> right on. Uh, so on a, on a positive note, I just want to compliment the legislature. Um, the this, this CTE and STEM investment grants that they've made is, have been just very already, that started two years ago. We're seeing the kinds of examples all over the state that Betsy mentioned of new programs starting up. There is now a funding stream for K-12 that it basically focuses on CTE. Yeah. This is all really positive. There's a lot more work to do. This is the number one issue. You go around the state, every part of the state raises this issue. Skilled workforce at all levels is, is critically important. We still have a lot of work to do, but I think some good progress has been made recently. Yeah. I'm very proud in my district of Reedsport High School. Three years ago, they got one of the CTE revitalization grants. They took a quarter of a million dollars, rebuilt a shop. The students start in the ninth grade. By the time they graduate, they have 1,000 hours of pre-apprenticeship training, and they're specialized. They have partnered with one of our local highway construction companies, and they're training students for highway construction, and we also have a, a shipbuilding yard in Reedsport, and they're also training as marine welders so they're getting actual on-the-job training that they can use and it's just a wonderful wonderful thing but we need to again there needs to be more investment in it um, representative Gomberg stepped in one of our coastal caucus members and I didn't want to miss our uh, brand new member our freshman representative David Brock Smith who shares half of Senator Cruz's district he is right now um, uh, facilitating a panel on sudden oak death which if you haven't heard about is is a critically important issue in southern Oregon that we have got to deal with. It is a threat to the timber industry, and it's something that he's been working very hard on, but I know his name hadn't been mentioned as one of our Coastal Caucus members. Uh, are there other, we're going to go just a couple minutes over. We started a little bit late to see. Are there any other questions in the audience for this panel? Uh, David walked in, and everybody got quiet. Uh, all right, any final comments from the panel? Oh, oh, there we go. Representative Boone. Thank you. Um, I actually sat on the Rural Policy Advisory Council, Council and David, um, oh no, what? I can't think of his name. Anyway, Osmano. Aunt Jim, Osmano was the, was the head. We were, we were instrumental in identifying different um, aspects of 
concerns in the rural areas, and one of them was infrastructure. And I remember him going around and identifying all the infrastructure needs, and it was a huge, it was like $26 billion or whatever. And because of that number, everybody was so afraid to even say it out loud. But I think that having that person as a, in the governor's office, um, like we now have in resilience, um, brings that to a, a level of importance that will get it some more attention. And it can collaborate with other groups, you know, like the, the all the ABCs, what EIEIOs that Betsy <laughs> mentioned, and then get the collaboration going between the business industry and sectors and the workforce training. And I think it, it keeps somebody on that point to keep reminding, because I know the governor's office is full of a lot of different levels of attention for, dis for issues. So I, I really like that. And I think the time is right for that. Great. Thank you, Representative. Anyone else? Any final comments from our panel? Well, I don't have a gavel in my hand, but on that note, I will call this panel adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all.